Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm glad you're here this morning at Marlowe Baptist Church, and we're grateful that you came. Uh, we're looking forward to the day when we'll all be able to get back together again and won't have to worry about whether we can hug or not. Amen. So uh, I'm glad you're here. I've got a couple of announcements to make, but I'm going to make those prior to the message. And right now we're going to have uh, Brother Richard come again. We're not singing congregationally yet, and uh, they tell us that's uh, not safe. So and how could we sing in these masks anyway? Amen. It'd be tough. Well, I'd sound better. I know that. But uh, anyway, uh, Brother Richard is going to come, and Brother Buddy Sheffield is going to come. Let me pray. Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for our folks that are here today. It's always such an awesome blessing to see them. We've got a lot of folks still at home. We've got some people that are struggling health-wise, uh, Lord, in other ways in their life. You know those needs. You promise to meet all those needs according to your riches and glory in Christ. So we claim that for our church body, our families, our brethren scattered around the world. We claim it for our nation, Lord. We need you in a desperate way and pray you'd bless our time now today. Thank you for Lord Christ and so great salvation in him and him alone, his shed blood, our eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Richard. Up, buddy. Well, you know we're in some uh, uh, we're in some trying times. I don't have to tell you that. You know it. We uh, uh, we have uh, bet between the virus and and all the uh, riots and things going on and just uh, uh, everything. It's uh, trying times, and so it's good to have something positive. And everything. So when we talk to people, you know, we as Christians can give them uh, some positive uh, encouragement and everything. And this song we're going to sing this morning is entitled Conversation Peace. And it's talking about our conversation getting back from the things that we normally talk about that we see on the news and everything to things of, uh, that are positive, things of the Lord. So Anyway, conversation peace. I can talk about the weather, places that I've been, all the things that I have plans to do. But there's a peace that I've been given since I gave my heart to him. And that's what I'd really like to share with you. It's a conversation piece. It's beyond my understanding. I'd love to tell you what he's done for me. It's a feeling I can't hide. I can't keep it down inside For the peace of God is a conversation peace If I don't seem to get excited About the latest news the winning team or the war that just broke out. If my conversation seems to lead to him, it's just because I found something I just love to talk about. It's a conversation piece. It's beyond my understanding. I love to tell you what he's done for me. It's a feeling I can't hide. I can't keep it down inside. For the peace of God is a conversation. Peace like a river flowing through my life each day. 
Oh, the peace of God is a conversation peace. Yes, the peace of God is a conversation peace. Amen. Amen. Good job. Amen. Well, all right. Children's church, youngins, we're having children's church, so if you're here and uh, you got, got a little more today, babe. That is my wife for all you tuned in around the world, or am I being a little optimistic, you know? I, maybe I'm being a little optimistic there. That's why I called her babe, all right? All right, good job, Richard. Man, you got on that, you climbed that ladder there to the end, bro. Man, way to go, way to go. Well, I'm glad you're here today, beloved. I, uh, I think I found out kind of through the grapevine this past week that there might be a few folks that uh, are maybe offended by my messages the last couple of weeks. And the one thing I didn't want to do was offend anybody. But I got a fire in my belly. And uh, I, I'm just, if you read my newsletter this week, I kind of shared my heart with you. And I... Uh, made the comment in there, if it's not acceptable, I'll resign as pastor. And I didn't mean that as a threat. What I meant was, is that I don't want to be a reproach or an offense to this church or anybody else. And uh, we're going to keep plowing some ground. Uh, I'm going to get into the heart of this message next Sunday on seven things Christians can do to destroy America. Seven things we can do as God's people to destroy America. And uh, But I'm not going to get there today. I'm going to finish up what I wanted to finish up on last week and share a couple of things with you that God has brought to my mind. So I don't want to be offensive. I don't. To you or to the Lord, or to this church. I will never, from this pulpit, endorse a political candidate by name. I will not do that. As much as I want to, I will not do that. But I will share, when it comes time to begin to vote, I'm, we're going to look at the platforms of the two major parties and one more party that has risen to what we might call power in the United States, a political force or party that's a third entity in the United States right now. I will not endorse a candidate. Now, if you want to ask me after the service, after, after I'm out, done out of the pulpit, I, I'll be glad to share. I will. But I'm not from this pulpit. So don't get nervous about that, okay? Don't, don't be nervous about that. In the way of an announcement, Brother Alan Farrar passed away Friday afternoon. Virginia called me. I was at work, and she called me. I knew he was in a, in a bad way. He did, according to Tess, contract the virus, but Brother Alan was in a bad way before he became sick with that virus, and they had moved him, uh, of course, in hospice care to the uh, VA facility in Temple, and he passed away there. So pray for Virginia, their families, Alan's family. His funeral will be Thursday afternoon at 5 o'clock at Mark Burns Label Funeral Home, and uh, visitation is at 4, the funeral at 5. I believe Richard's going to sing a song or two, and they've asked me to conduct a service along with maybe a relative that Alan had that will be a part of that service. Then he's going to be buried down in the valley, um, I forgot the name of the town now. In Harlingen? Is that where it is? In Harlingen? 
so uh, they will have the uh, burial and graveside the next day in Harlingen. I want to clarify a couple of things that uh, I said last Sunday. Well, really one major thing and add to it. <clears throat> During the message last Sunday, and you know how I am, I did a lot of rabbit hunting last Sunday. In the last three months or so, I hadn't done any rabbit hunting. I've been real careful about that, and I got to hunting rabbits last week, and I run out of time. I guess it's more better said ran out of time, but this is, I am country, and uh, I, don't, I don't want you to think that I've improved my diction in any way after these, all these weeks. So I made the statement during the message that I am through with the NFL and the NBA, and I included MLB, because MLB has argued all summer long about how much are we gonna make, and how, what are we, all a bunch of spoiled brats as far as I'm concerned, okay? So I don't know about MLB. I love baseball. I love it all. But I made the statement that, that uh, I'm through with the NFL and the NBA, and I am. I am. I'm through with them. They're a platform for all that's going on in America right now, the divisiveness and the race relations and all that. They've added fuel to the fire. And uh, I, I'm going to tell you, uh, we, uh, we need a move of God in this country. But I'm not going to support or be a part of watching them and their agenda. As much as I love the spectacle and the sports arena and as my whole life has been intertwined and grown up in sports and being a part of it. And also, ESPN is not welcome in my house anymore. I've learned to live without it. It's been on, but all it's been about, not much sports, a lot of political stuff on it. ESPN. So I am through with ESPN and its affiliates, and uh, it, and I think I made the comment last week about gun smoke. And did I say Sister Kitty? Did I say that? I might have said that. I don't. Did I say that, Sister Kitty? Well, I'm just hoping Kitty's in heaven. I, I really am. That maybe Kitty got saved, but I should have said Miss Kitty. And my daughter from Midland said, <laughs> I said Sister Kitty. So. Uh, Sorry, Kitty. I hope she was a sister by the time she entered into eternity. Well, teacher, how do I, where do I start this morning after rabbit hunting all this time? Teacher or faculty-led prayer was removed from public schools by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1962. Tom, I was 13 years old. Now, I asked Jeannie. Jeannie and I have talked about this. I really don't remember teachers praying with us. I don't remember that. I, Ms. Mary Lawrence was my first grade teacher. First day of school. First day of school. Little yahoo that I was. Big old buck teeth and that blonde hair, you know. And she come in the room before class started, and we were, all us little young'uns, were, having graduated from Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Hubert's kindergarten, Ms. Hubert's kindergarten, where the bistro is right now. That was the kindergarten house. And uh, Ms. Lawrence, Ms. Mary Lawrence, came in and found me and Lindsay Jacks. I don't know if Lindsay Jacks is still alive. And the third person, I can't remember, but we were chasing each other around the room. And Ms. Mary Lawrence brought us up to the front of the room, up with little first graders feeling our oats now. And she gave us paddling with a bolo paddle right there. First day of my school career, I got a whooping. Went downhill from there. No, not really. I did get a few licks in my time. But you know, I don't remember teachers praying with us. Anybody in here remember that? Any of us older folk remember a teacher leading us? In? Pete, do you, brother? You really do? And that was in Arkansas? A lot more spiritual in Arkansas than we were in Texas, okay? You, you remember Elaine? You remember a teacher praying with you? Really? Anybody remember a prayer led over the intercom system? Betty, Duh, Tom, Duh, okay. I, I, you do, sister? I, I don't remember that. I, I just, uh, you know, from elementary to junior high and, and then 
uh, into high school. I, I don't remember any of that. But anyway, I was 13 year, years old when prayer was removed from public school. Then in January of 1973, 11 years later, the Supreme Court ruled abortion legal in the United States as a method of birth control. From 1962 to 2020, 58 years, almost three full generations, three generations minus two years, shy of becoming a fourth generation, 58 years of the Supreme Court denying godly teachers and administrators of introducing students to the value and the power of prayer, who for the vast majority of these students, for the vast majority, come from homes that never pray. Amen? Can I get a witness on that? Come from homes that never pray or acknowledge a creator God. Even when I was in school, when I was a youngster, there was a lot of my classmates that didn't go to church at all. Even their, even their parents didn't go. Nowadays, I wonder what the percentage is today. But 58 years of no prayer, you cannot pray, uh, cannot be led by, students can pray, but you can't have an adult or somebody in charge or in, on the staff of a public school pray. We have seen a lot of changes in our society, not only, from, not only from not being able to pray, but how about when abortion was real legal, can take the death of an unborn child, and even now in our day, children that are born, you have a little time in some states to make up your mind. Can you imagine in the United States of America? Almost four generations, fixing to begin the fourth generation of citizens of the United States who have been dulled and immunized to the value and the sanctity of human life and not being able to pray in public places. Public places. And now, in our cities and towns around America, you know what we're doing, beloved? We are reaping the rotten fruit of godlessness. It's what we're doing. Godlessness. I wish I could say that this was a passing occurrence. You know, what would he say? A passing fad? I wish we could say that. Something that would die out with time. But near 60 years of telling our young people and then their young people and the third generation of citizens who are raising their families now and soon to begin a fourth, telling their children that God is not welcome in public arenas, whether it's schools or sporting events or businesses or halls of government. Near four generations, almost four generations of United States citizens that have sown the wind and are now reaping the whirlwind, as it says in Hosea chapter 8 <coughs> and verse 7. That Hebrew word for whirlwind is sufal, and it means a hurricane, a storm, or a tempest. Sow the wind, God said, you'll reap the whirlwind or the storm. Near four generations of citizens of the United States who have been deceived and lured into complacency and humanism, entitledness, deserving of all that's desired or wanted. You hear the commercials on TV. You need to get, you deserve this. And we've been fed that line for years and years and years now. We deserve what we've got here in America, the plenty and the prosperity and the freedom. You deserve it, they say. You deserve the 75-inch TV. So knock a window out and go in and get it. You deserve these things. We've been taught that life is cheap. 
It's not a precious, invaluable gift from God that's to be cherished and protected at all cost or sacrifice. We've been taught that. Our children have been taught that. The result of no God and valueless life is paraded in the streets of our cities and we watch it on the newscasts. You watch it. No God and valueless life is paraded in the streets of our cities, hating and reviling all that are in authority or anyone that would dare to stand up or speak up against them. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Wow, what a passage. God says, be not deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't fool yourself. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows. I've been up to her house a couple of times, and man, those water, I'm going to tell you, I love watermelon. Ooh, I love watermelon. And I thought about sneaking out there about midnight one night, like we did a couple of times when we was kids, and getting me a watermelon, but Bertie would probably be watching. No, Bertie, I wasn't thinking about that, sis. But boy, there are beautiful melons out there. Wow. But you know what? Whoever sowed those watermelons, they didn't plant corn out there. They planted watermelon seed. And you know what? They're reaping what they sowed. And God says, don't be deceived. I'm not mock. Whatever you sow, that or wh that's what you're going to reap. For he that sows, or she that sows to the flesh. The flesh. We don't like to talk about the flesh. Not, not this. I've got a sore on my thumb and it cracked open. It's very painful. It hurts me. Not that kind of flesh. We're talking about who we are on the inside before we're saved and that same old man or that same old nature we have after we're saved. So he says, who that he that or she that sows to the flesh, that old man and that old nature that we battle with every day, every moment of our Christian life, we battle that old nature. For whoever sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, decay, and ruin and destruction, but he or she that sows to the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, will of the Spirit reap life everlasting or everlasting life. So we see this battle going on, not only in our own personal lives, but in America today. We see the flesh versus the Spirit, old nature versus new nature, corruption versus life. And it's played out on the screen of American society in graphic detail. It's a war of culture. It's a war of morality. It's a war of civility. And it's a war of spirituality. Spirituality. We're not only in a war for the heart and soul of America, and we're in such strife, we're in a spiritual war. Proverbs 14, 34, used it many, many times righteousness exalts a nation that word exalts is a really great word it means to be high or to rise up or to extol to expose for all to see in all its goodness righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach a shame or a reproof to any people any people righteousness versus unrighteousness you know what I'm sure in 1962, when prayer was ruled illegal, I guess if you want to call it, not welcome, led by teachers and administrators and staff in public schools, I'm sure that there was an uproar. I bet there was. I bet there was. And again in 1973, over the death to babies ruling by the Supreme Court of the United States, I'm sure there was a huge uproar. And there's been a battle fought over that ever since. I understand that. I, I am pro-life. There's no such thing as pro-choice. You're either pro-death or you're pro-life. And that's all. There ain't no in-between. Ain't no in-between. And I'm sure that there was a huge uproar when the, our Supreme Court justices, was it seven to two maybe? I I should have looked that up. It seemed like to me it was seven to two in favor of killing babies. I'm sure there was an uproar, and the battle has been fought ever since. I was too young and dumb in 1962 to care about the prayer thing. 
I was too lost to really be concerned about it in 1973. I wasn't saved until 12, 9, 21 months later in September of 1974. I really wasn't concerned with that. I mean, that, that didn't bother me. I mean, I, I, it wasn't going to bother me. I had no, I had no uh, spirituality about that. I, had, I really, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think much about that. But then when I got saved, hey, spiritual issues began to be important to me. And now, at 70 years old, they are vitally important to me. Because I've got kids and i got grandkids that are growing up. And you've got children here today, some of you. We've got kids that need our protection. They need, they need our prayers. They need our guidance and our direction and our teaching. And I got that fire in my belly. I do. I do. That's why God said to us... As his people, if you'll humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, not the Marxist wicked ways, not the abortionist wicked ways. He said, if we'll turn, turn from our wicked ways, our lethargy and our lack of concern and passion, I know there's people that don't like this kind of preaching and they say there's no place for it. I'm going to challenge folk at the end of this message today. I'm going to challenge us and other preachers and other churches. I'm going to do that. I don't know how many people will hear it, but I need to be challenged. I'd rather go home, get in my chair, and watch Sister Kitty and not have to fight the battle. But I said in my newsletter this week, I'm not going down with the blood of this nation or you on my hands having not stood up. Uh, I might go down, but it won't be with your blood or the nation's blood on my hands. It might be my own spilt blood. That's a huge responsibility God has laid on us, beloved. Second Chronicles 7, 14. The psalmist said in Psalm 141, 4, Lord, incline not my heart. Don't incline my heart or submit me or consent to any evil thing or be occupied in deeds of wickedness with men who work iniquity and let me not eat of their dainties. And that's where we finished last week. Proverbs 23, 3, do not desire his dainties, that king that you might sit down to eat with, that ruler or that person of prominence or position or power. Don't desire his dainties, for it says, for they are deceptive food. If they're not a Christian, if they don't love the Lord Jesus, they'll deceive you and they'll deceive me if we're not careful. Oh, this, the spread looks so wonderful. And we sit down to it. You know why our nation is in crisis? Because we've substituted the appetizers and the dainties for that meat that we need to sustain ourselves. It's what we've done. Jesus said to his disciples, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You see, beloved, we're called and sent. That's the entree for us. The calling and the sending of Lord Jesus. The call to the, through the gospel to salvation, then the call to discipleship and witness and ambassadorship. And then we're sent to share the gospel with people who are lost like I was. The main course of our service should be to do the will of him that sent us and saved us. I like the dainty plates. I do. I love the the nachos before the big steak comes out or the big Mexican food meal comes out. I like that kind of stuff. But I don't want to live on just that. I love cherry pie and banana pudding, nanner pudding. I like all that. But give me something that's got some substance to it, some gravity to it, some power to it. You ever heard of progressive Christianity? Everybody, anybody ever heard of it? It's sweeping, it has been sweeping through America, I guess, in the world. Well, I looked up the eight tenets of progressive 
Christianity. Number one, believe, we believe that following the path of the teacher Jesus. Man, number one, and, and I'm off course right now, of the teacher Jesus can lead to healing and wholeness, a mystical connection to God, as well as an awareness and experience of not only the sacred, but the oneness and the unity of all life. That's just number one. Number two, affirm that the teachings of Jesus provide but one of many ways to experience God. Do you believe this? The sacredness, oneness, and unity of life. And in that, we can draw from diverse sources of wisdom, including wisdom now from including earth in our spiritual journey. So you know what I did after I read that second one? I went outside, dug me a hole, and I sat in it for a while to get some of earth's wisdom. You know what, Mark? I, didn't, I wasn't any more, more wise when I got up than I was when I sat down. I mean, this is unreal. You know how many churches have bought into this in America? You know how many Baptist churches have bought into this baloney? Number three, seek and create community that is inclusive of all people, including but not limited to, hold that, now that's good, conventional Christians, is that what I am? <laughs> am I a conventional Christian? Is that what I am? I don't know. And questioning skeptics, believers and agnostics, those of all races, cultures, and nationalities, some of these are really right, some of these are good. Those of all sexual orientations and all gender identities, those of all classes and abilities, those historically marginalized, and how about this one? All creatures and plant life. I wonder if it's a, I wonder if it's a, what do you call this? A, it's not real, what is it? Artificial, that's it, artificial. I wonder if they're talking about that too. All creatures and plant life. Number four, know the way we behave towards one another and earth is the fullest expression of what we believe. Therefore, we vow to walk as Jesus might have walked in this world with radical compassion, inclusion, and bravery to confront and positively change the injustices we experience as well as those we see others experiencing. Find grace in the search for understanding and believe there is more value in questioning with an open mind and an open heart than in absolutes or dogma. Let me, let me just say right there, you know what this book is? This is a book of absolutes. Amen? If it's not, if there's anything in this book that's not absolute, then John 3.16 can't be absolute either. How could we, how could we trust John 3.16? Work toward peace and justice among all people and all life on earth. Protect and restore the integrity of our earth and all creation. Commit to a path of lifelong learning, compassion, and selflessness love, and selfless love on this journey toward a personally authentic and meaningful faith. Now, some of that is good. Some of that is good. But you know what not mentioned in the eight tenets of progressive Christianity at all? That this book is the infallible, inerrant Word of God. Not mentioned. That Jesus Christ's death was for, the, was for sin on the cross and that His blood washes white as snow to those who come to Him. That he, when we come to Him, you know what that'll do? That'll take care of the race problem in America. And the strife and the stuff going on in America right now. That'll take care of the race problem and racism. Folks who really get saved and who love the Lord Jesus and who care about our fellow man, whether they're black or brown or white or pink and purple polka dotted, it wouldn't make any difference. This is what a lot of denominations and churches are sharing today from the pulpit. That earth, our relationship with soil and plants is just as important as our relationship with each other. Boy, how skewed things are in the pulpits of America today. The dainty plate is laid out there for all of us to partake in and enjoy with no meat on it. 
nothing to fuel us for the battle that we're in, the spiritual battle. Is it any wonder our nation is going to hell on a grease pole? If we've forgotten our calling as salt and light, why should we expect the lost people that we come in contact with to desire Jesus and turn from wickedness like we did when we came to Christ? I wasn't as bad as I could be, beloved. I grant that, but I was as bad off as I could be because I was lost and on my way to hell. If our hearts are not burdened and grieved for what we see in our nation and in our country and the way people neglect and run from the gospel, if we're not grieved by that, who will be? You remember 9-11? Where were you at 9-11? We could all, when we heard the news, I bet we could all say, except for our young ones, of course, I know where I was. A day that will live in infamy as long as there's history to be remembered. And you know what else I heard this week on the, on the news? There was a 9-11 memorial, and I don't know if it was in New York or where, and I'm sorry, it wasn't the major one, but it was a 9-11 memorial that was set up to honor uh, firefighters and policemen, and it was vandalized. What's next? What's next? Just because it's a monument or a statue, it, nothing's, nothing's safe anymore. I mean, that hadn't been that long ago. That would have had nothing to do with 150, 200 years ago. 9-11 will live in infamy. A shocked America. You remember how we did for three or four days after that. We sat in front of our TVs and we watched the buildings. We watched them burning and then we watched them try to clean up and the smoke rising and we saw the, the footage over and over of those people running down those streets in New York and that huge cloud of debris and dust was billowing up behind them. And we were in shock. It was my mom's birthday and we celebrated her birthday by with the TV on, you remember, Paula? And we were just all aghast and shocked at what had happened to our country, America. We reeled at the reality of the death and destruction come to our homeland at the hands of a ruthless and a godless and a committed enemy bent on destroying our nation and our very freedom and way of life. And by the way, they're still our enemy and they're still out to get us. We're currently fighting a war against them, not on a large scale like we were, but we've got men and women overseas that are trying to take care and provide more our freedom to keep people from coming over here and doing that again. They carry out their jobs with valor and they risk their lives so we can gather here this morning in safety. God bless our military, amen? God bless our law enforcement and our firemen and those men and women that put themselves on the front line for our safety. They're under huge attack today in our country. God help us. Who would have ever thought that we would see that in America? But may I say this, beloved, that we within the borders of the land of the free and the home of the brave, we're engaged in a war just as fierce and deadly right now just as fierce and deadly. The church, the true church, believers in Christ and churches that preach this book are in danger. We're in the crosshairs of the ungodly and they're bent on winning at all costs. If they can silence us by intimidation or fear of reprisal by government agencies, that's what they'll do. If we remain hunkered down in our safe places in the walls of our buildings, our churches, and our homes, and by the way, we just think they're safe. Amen? We just think they're... A lot of those folks in cities around America thought their businesses were safe. If we remain complacent, if we remain fat and happy and satisfied in our religiosity and not willing to stir the pot, not willing to get involved if we refuse to believe that our beloved nation is under assault in a way that transcends exponentially the horror of 9-11, then 2 Chronicles 7-14 will not work. You know why? Because we will not see the need 
to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. We won't see the need. We will assume that ostrich syndrome. Now, you know, I always wondered about that as a kid. Was it true that an ostrich, when he felt dangered, would stick his head in the sand? We were always told that. Philip, you know anything about that, bro? I don't either. But we'll assume that ostrich syndrome. And we'll stick our heads in the sand and hoping everything will turn out okay after a while and then we can get up and go on and live our life. We are on the brink, beloved, of what I believe and what I know to be the absolute most important election in my 70-year lifetime. I don't know much about before that or even when I was a little feller. But I know there's never been a more serious and important election that's fixing to take place, maybe in the whole history of our nation. And I feel pretty safe in saying that. The issues at stake are so far-reaching and so serious, I can't help but fear the outcome. And if that, if that lessens your estimation of me because I use the word fear, I'm sorry. But I fear the outcome if this thing goes wrong. I fear the outcome. Not for me, I've already lived 70 years, but for my kids and my grandkids and your children and the future of this nation, I fear the outcome. I don't know if we'd ever be able to come back from what's going to take place. You know what's going to take place. You've been watching the news. You know what some of these people say they want to do. If that's not spiritual, forgive me. We'll look at the issues in the platform right before election time when we begin to vote. And that storm that's brewing and boiling in the belly of our nation is already a Category 5. It's already serious. It's licking its chops for clearance by ungodly politicians and federal judges and Supreme Court justices. It's just boiling and, and foaming and waiting to explode across the whole of America instead of just a few cities, major cities around the country. All it needs is somebody to say, go get them. And brother, you think Cameron, Texas or Texas will be immune to what's going on? No way. Our adversary, the devil, is roaring in America like never before, and he's attacking and influencing and distressing believers. Or have you been distressed? Have you been? I have. I have. Man, you say, Brother Wayne, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yes! Brother Wayne, do you believe that? Yes, I believe that. I've seen it work in my own life when there was great need before. I'm struggling with that right now. I'm sorry. I am. Don't be anxious. Well, I am anxious. I am. There are many willing accomplices and pawns to do the devil's work also. You see, beloved, the church must stand up for Jesus. We must stand up. We must. We must stand up for the Word of God. We must. This is all baloney. Progressive Christianity. You know what? This book doesn't change no, how, no matter how much society changes. If, it, if this book changed with society, we're all dead ducks anyway. None of it's true. But I thank God that it's all true. And that what he said in Genesis 1-1 is just as true as what he said in John 3-16. We must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We must stand up for our earthly home, America. And that's the fire in my belly is to stand up for her and stand up for our children. In 1 Samuel 17-29, after David heard Goliath's challenge, you remember the story, one of the great stories in all the Word of God, the Israeli army led by Saul 
They were out there on the battlefield to do battle with the Philistines, and the Philistines paraded out this man that was almost 10 foot tall, maybe 9, 7, 9, 8, 9, 9. You say, oh, Brother Wayne, that's one of those fables in the Bible. No! He was that big, and he carried a sword that was big enough to, about as big as Tom, and his shield, and his helmet, and he cursed the, the Israeli nation, the army, and he cursed them and made fun of them, called them dogs. And here come little old shepherd boy David to bring his brothers who were serving in the army with Saul, and there his brothers were cowered down in fear just like Saul and the rest of them. One man, one man, big man, one man. Remember the song, Big John, Big John, Big Bad John. Well, this was Big Bad Goliath. And they were scared to death and cowered down. And little old David, young boy, come out there and he viewed the situation and his brothers mocked him for coming. You remember? Read the story. And David looked out there and he saw the army of the Philistines and he heard the giant cursing the Israeli army. You know what David said? Man, isn't there not a cause here? <laughs> I mean, it, doesn't something need to be done here? So you know the story. Saul put his armor on David after David talked him into letting him go out there, and it was too big, so David went out there with his shepherd's gear and a sling and how many? Five smooth stones? Five smooth stones. Somebody said Goliath had four brothers. Now, I don't know if he took, you know, that's what I heard one time. I'm not sure about that. Maybe I should be. But you know what he did. He went out and killed that rascal and cut his head off. He said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for us standing up for God? The God that brought you here on this mountainside to fight this battle? Is, is there not a cause? Remember in 2 Kings 7, 3, one of the great stories again? The Syrian army had besieged the walls of the city of Samaria. And the people, in, you know how they did? They laid siege to those cities back in the day and they'd just see, they'd, they'd get, surround the cities and they'd wait and wait and wait. Finally, they'd run out of water, run out of food. Well, the residents of Samaria, the city, the wall city in Samaria, you know what they were doing? They were killing their own children and eating them to keep from starving to death. That's how desperate the situation was. They were killing their children and eating them inside the city because the army, the enemy army was encamped outside. There was four lepers sitting outside the gate. See, they couldn't come into the city, the lepers. So there was four lepers sitting at the gate and they were starving too, by the way. And in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 7, one of them finally said, they said to one another, why should we sit here till we die? We're going we're gonna to die anyway. Man, let's do something. Let's do something. So you know what they did? They got up and they walked toward the camp of the Assyrian army. And when they got there, you know what they found? All them rascals had fled. Sister Carol, there wasn't any of them left. And all their food and all their spoil and all the bounty was there. This huge army had fled. These four leprous men walking toward them. And you know what? Boy, they started eating and they started enjoying this. They thought, man, we're rich. We'll never have no They had leprosy, by the way. though. But they said, you know what? This isn't right. Let's go back to the city and tell the folks what we found. And it saved the city in Samaria. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14. Or Nehemiah chapter 4. You remember Nehemiah had come back from uh, captivity? With, and the enemies of the Jews were threatening to storm the walls that Nehemiah was overseeing being rebuilt around the city of Jerusalem, which were torn down by Nebuchadnezzar 70 plus years before. And Nehemiah said, and I looked and I rose up and I said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Those enemies outside the walls that have mocked and cursed and made fun of you, they threatened your life, they threatened your families. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, he said. You remember, remember, Alamo, remember the Alamo, remember Goliad? 
They said here, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Wow. I would say this, beloved, as long as you allow me to be the pastor of this church, I covenant with you and with God to preach this book without fear or favor of man. I covenant together with you to preach this book. What any, no matter what anybody says, no matter what, no matter who comes to power, I promise to preach this book. And if I may quote General George Patton, he's one of my heroes. Man, he was a rough dude. I talked to my dad about him. Dad served in World War II, and, and uh, Patton had that feud with, uh, with uh, Montgomery, the British general. You know, they feuded back and forth and back and forth about who was going to take this place or win this battle and who was going to get all the acclaim for it. But you remember at the beginning of that movie when George Patton walked out in front of those men and he said, I'll tell you this, I'll be proud to lead you wonderful soldiers into battle. Man, I love that movie, Patton. Rough language, but I, I love the movie. And I love what he stood for and our military stood for. Freedom and honor and victory. I'll be glad to lead you into battle. Isaiah 59, 19, the Bible says, when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard or a banner against him, the enemy. And you know who that standard is? You know what that banner is? It's us, beloved. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God will lift up a battle, a banner when the battle gets on, when the battle is on. And that's us. If we don't stand for our nation, stand for our families, and stand for our churches, Who's going to? Who's going to? Last week I shared with you the seven vitals of the redeemed church of the Lord Jesus. We've got to be passionate in our love for Christ. Passionate. We've got to be zealous in our prayer life. Zealous in our prayer life. We've got to be intense in our study of the Word of God. We've got to be familiar with God's Word. We've got to memorize it. There's been people in other countries that wish they had when a socialist regime took over and took away their Bibles. We've got to be zealous in our study and memorization of God's Word. We've got to be committed to sharing and witnessing the gospel with those people we come in contact with. We've got to be fervent in our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Fervent. We've got to be faithful to support the church and its ministries. Faithful. And we've got to be obedient to live a godly and a righteous life. Passionate, zealous, intense, committed, fervent, faithful, and obedient. God help us. God help us. Only a complete surrender to His will. Remember Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Only a surrender to the will of God in our lives allows us to exhibit these seven vital signs of a redeemed church, of people of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I read something to you out of my American Patriots Bible? That's what this is. While much has been written in recent years to try to dismiss the fact that America was founded upon the biblical principles of Judeo-Christianity, all the revisionism in the world cannot change the facts. Anyone who examines the original writings, personal correspondence, biographies, and public statements of the individuals who were instrumental in the founding of America will find an abundance of quotations showing the profound extent to which their thinking and lives were influenced by a Christian worldview. This is not to say that all of the founding fathers were Christians. No, they were not. And I'm not so naive to think that they were. Clearly they were not, but the point is, even those who were not Christians were deeply influenced by the principles of Christianity. And that's what we were as a nation at one time. 
Never was America a Christian nation. Never. Fully Christian, no. But I'm going to tell you, God's people and the churches in America had some conviction and some backbone and stood up for what was right, and our influence pervaded American society. So he's saying here that Christians deeply influenced these men, a mindset that helped to shape their political ideas. It is possible to be so distracted with whether Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson ever put their personal faith in Jesus Christ that one misses the fact that the founders almost all thought from a biblical perspective whether they believed or not. Clearly, there was a predominant Christian consensus in colonial America that shaped the founders' thinking and their writing of the founding documents and laws resulting in the republic we have today. The Declaration of Independence identified the source of all authority and rights as their creator and then accentuated that individual human rights were God-given and not man-made. Thus, there would be no king or established religion to stand in the way of human liberty, liberty or dignity, uniquely Judeo-Christian ideals. While most historians do not limit the founding fathers to the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention, this core group of men represents the religious sentiments of those who shape the political foundations of our nation. As a matter of public record, the delegates included 28 Episcopalians, 8 Presbyterians, seven Congregationalists, two Lutherans, two Dutch Reformed, two Methodists, two Roman Catholics, one unknown, and three deists, those who believed in a God, but that he just, he just created and left everything to run on its own course, deists. God who gave the world its initial impetus, but then left it to run its course, these deists, deists I mean, all these men were affiliated in some way with a belief and the thought and the fact that there was a creator God and that he ordained the course of men. A full 93% of its members were members of Christian churches and all were deeply influenced by a biblical view of mankind and government. What I want to do is I want to challenge us, beloved. I want to challenge us. From now until election day, and you know what? This is no big stretch for me. I, I'm going to child. I've already determined in my just like I'm not watching the NBA, the the uh, uh, NFL or ESPN anymore in my home. I'm not. I'm going to commit to Wednesdays every week. I'm going to fast and pray every Wednesdays. Now you say, Brother Wayne, that's old school and all that and fasting and all that. I've been through extended fasts in my Christian life before. I have, but I haven't done it in a long time. But I'm going to tell you, America is valuable enough and worth enough to me to give up one day. One 24-hour day of food and reminding me, and you know what that does when those hunger pangs come, and they will after that, man, that end of that day, and we've been used to eating three squares and, and, about, and uh, some round ones during in between, you know? Those hunger pangs will come, and it'll remind us, and it'll remind me that, hey, I'm supposed to be praying on Wednesday. It's our prayer meeting day anyway. We're not meeting at church right now on Wednesday night until things kind of clear up better. We started back, now we're not. But I, I wanna, I'm going to challenge myself, and I've already committed from now on this coming Wednesday and from now to Election Day, I'm going to pray for America. I'm going to fast. I'm going to do without food on that day. And anybody that would be willing to join me, I would welcome you. I would. I'd welcome you. I want to get serious. And you know what fasting does? It humbles you. I mean, I, I've been, I said I've been on extended fast, and I have before. And, boy, I tell you, by the end of those days, you are humbled. You are humbled. So on Wednesdays, and what else I want to do is I want to challenge, I don't know how many preachers or how many people will see this or listen to it, but I want to challenge pulpits and preachers to get fired up about America and where she is and where we're headed and to preach, thus saith the Lord God, to share the gospel in a way we've never shared it before, to teach, our, to teach your people in those churches, guys, to teach your people that it's okay to stand up and it's okay to speak up. It's okay to do those things. It's okay to stand against perversion. It's okay to do that. Come on, get some backbone. Get some backbone. And I know there are preachers doing it. But what if, 
What if just a thousand preachers in Texas started doing it? Just a thousand of the tens of thousands that there are. I'm going to fast and pray every Wednesday now until election day. See what God does. I'm going to see what he does. Can we be delivered from what's wanting to be poured out on this country? I don't know. God knows, but I want to do my best. Father, I thank you for our nation. I thank you for your word. I thank you for our Savior. Our nation's changed, but your word and our Savior haven't changed. You haven't changed. The Holy Spirit hasn't changed. Your God is, I mean, our God and our Savior and the Holy Spirit that fills us and seals us and empowers us to serve you is still the same Holy Spirit that came down on Jesus and anointed him for service at his baptism. God in heaven, the same Holy Spirit that moved upon the face of the waters during creation. And as you spoke the worlds and the universe into existence, all that's known to us and unknown, God, you're still the same. And I pray you'd help us, Lord, to stand up for you, stand up for our Savior, stand up with the Holy Spirit's power and help, and stand up for your word, Lord. Help us, I pray. May you bless our people. May you bless your people. May you bless our families, your families. And God, we pray for those that, in, that are in need now in this body, in this fellowship. Move in this church. Move in our hearts. Move in this county, this state, this nation. God, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, beloved.